Why isn't she looking closer? She needs to look closer. Focus. Do not forget my story, Senua. Because your darkness comes from hell, and your fate lies there. They say the burning of a corpse will take you straight to Hela's gate. But gods and the living will follow this path. You must leave the Isles of Orkney across the Eastern Sea and find a road that leads north and down through deep, dark valleys. After nine nights of riding, you will follow a great river and will find a bridge covered in gold. The path to Helheim goes from there, across the river of knives that flows in the dark world of Niflheim. The Northmen speak of nine worlds. The world of men they call Midgard. Sky gods dwell in Asgard. The gods of earth, harvest, wind and sea dwell in Vanaheim. The good elves dwell in Alfheim. The evil ones dwell in Svartalfheim. The mountain giants dwell in Jotunheim. The fire giants dwell in Muspelsheim. Niflheim is the world of ice and darkness. Only the dead dwell in Helheim. And that is where you must travel. Waiting for you to make that little slip. You can't just wish things away. The world of the dead is ruled by the giantess, Hela, daughter of Loki. The gods feared her bloodline, bad on her mother's side, and yet much worse on her father's. So, as a child, the Allfather cast her down into Helheim and gave her power over those who die of sickness, age, hardship, and self-slaughter. In all of the nine worlds, only Hela can resurrect the dead. To Hela, your Dillion was sacrificed, and with her you must bargain. Spill their blood to open the gate to Helheim and enter the land of the dead. To Dillian, to his soul. It won't open. How will she get through? Why won't it open? Why can't The Northmen say that in the beginning there was nothing but darkness. Bitter cold to the north, fiery hot to the south. They say the cold formed ice, which melted from the sparks from the south. The power of the darkness gave life to the dripping ice, and the first giant was born, and was named Ymir. The ice continued to drip, and the power of the void gave life to it, and it became a cow whose milk fed the giant. That's right, a cow, but you weren't expecting that. Ymir was a frost giant, a being of darkness, and all his sons and grandsons were dark after him. Of his daughters and granddaughters, some were monstrous, but others fair. But there was another who came from the ice, Buri. In shape, he was like a man, big and powerful. His son, Bor, took a fair giant to be his wife, and they had three sons. Odin was the eldest, and the Northmen hold him to be the foremost of the gods, the Old Father. say that Odin is always in search of knowledge and wisdom and magic. There was a very wise being named Mimir who guarded the waters of wisdom which flew from the roots of the world tree. Odin wished to drink from this spring, but he had to pay a price. 
so he gouged out his own eye as offering to Mimir. He drank from the well and traded one way of seeing. The Northmen say that Odin and his brothers killed Ymir, and that the world of men was formed from his corpse. They made his bones into stone, and his flesh into earth, and his blood into the salt sea. They set his skull to be the bowl of the sky, with his brains for clouds. Odin and his brothers caught the sparks flying from Muspel, and made them into stars. And to protect the new world from the giants, they used Ymir's great curving eyebrows as walls. Into strangers. Exile makes sense when you realize that you were never really home in the first place. The Northmen say that Odin has two ravens. Their names are Thought and Memory, and each day he sends them out to fly all across the world. Upon their return, they perch on his shoulders and tell him everything they have seen and heard. In this way, he learns of things far and wide, and for this reason, he is called the Raven God. Cinema, like Odin. You must seek wisdom through thought and memory if you are to succeed in your quest. She wanted to marry Dillian. She came out to be her own darkness and marry Dillian. But she didn't work. She thought her curse would affect him. She thought her curse would spread to him. She thought she'd bring the darkness to him too. She nearly died. She thought the curse made her tainted. Druth helped her. The Northmen say you must sacrifice in order to receive. They tell how the runes were revealed to Odin only in sacrifice. He hung himself from the world tree, and he stabbed himself with a spear, and he dedicated the sacrifice to himself. For nine nights he hung on the tree without food or drink, and at last he saw the runes below him. He gave a cry, and gathered them in his mind and learnt them. Then he fell from the tree. Who spoke of his own darkness? the Northmen. The Northmen tell this story. Before the Earth was created, there was a world called Muspel. Because it was in the south, it was bright and hot, flaming, burning. Sparks that flew out from Muspel became the stars. Other sparks melted ice in the frozen world of Niflheim, creating the body of the first giant, Ymir. Muspel is one of the nine worlds, and is now the land of fire giants. And people from elsewhere cannot endure a journey there. The pyre. Sert. Sert is through there. He's waiting for her. You can't get through. How will she get through? She'll need to find another way. Truth and sand. Find your own path. The Northmen say that the defender of Muspel is called Surt, the foremost of the fire giants. His name means the Black One, because he is like something burnt. The Northmen believe that he sits at the border of Muspel with his flaming sword, and at the end of the world he will leave his post. He will travel to Asgard and Midgard, waging war against all the gods. He will be victorious and then burn the whole world with fire. What happened to Odin? 
happens when she finds it? And then Everything oh. will burn. Concentrate, concentrate on where you're going. She needs to remember the path. Everything will burn, then how will she find the way back? <laughs> she won't. She won't be able to tell. The Northmen believe that the world will be destroyed someday. They call it Ragnarok, the destiny of the gods. Asgard will be attacked by Surt and the fire giants. A monstrous wolf will swallow the sun, and the gods will fight in vain against their enemies. There is nothing they can do to prevent it, but Odin ever seeks knowledge and magic, hoping, hoping to find a way to postpone that dark day. The Northmen say that at Ragnarok, the sons of Muspel will travel to battle in the ship called Nagalfar, the corpse ship. And when the sons of Muspel leave the ship and ride to battle, it will be as though the sky had split open, and Surt will lead them. Wherever he goes, flame will erupt before him, and fires will burn behind him. say that what we see as a rainbow is the bridge that goes from the world of men to the world of the gods. For now, they say the frost giants and the mountain giants cannot cross it. But they say that when Ragnarok comes, not a thing in this world will be safe. The rainbow bridge will break under the onslaught of the fire giants riding on flaming steeds. Senua, I have seen the fire of Surt spread far The journey to Helheim is never a straight one. Each must find their own path. Align yourself to its secrets, and you will find yours. However you come to the gold-covered bridge that leads to Hell, you may find it guarded by a giantess. She will ask your name. She will ask your lineage. She will ask your business. The Northmen tell of the warrior woman Brynhild, who leapt into fire and rode to hell to join her slain love Sigurd, and is challenged by the giant. Hela possesses large dwelling places in Helheim. Tall are her walls, high are her gates. The name of her dish is hunger. Her knife is famine. On her threshold all will stumble. Her bed is called sick bed, and her bed hangings are called flames of a funeral pyre. They say she is easy to recognize, half black and half the color of flesh, and her face, menacing and grim. The Northmen tell of a great hero. His name is Sigmund. His father's hall was built around a great tree, and one day, Odin comes and thrusts a sword into the tree, a gift to whomever can release it. Many try, but the sword only comes out at Sigmund's touch. His brother-in-law, King Sigir, wants it, but Sigmund refuses him. So King Sigir plots revenge. He invites Sigmund and his brothers to a feast, but when they arrive, they are met with an army, not a warm welcome. 
King Sigir captures Sigmund and his brothers, steals his coveted sword, and readies them for execution. Death for Sigmund and his brothers seems certain. But the king's wife is Sigmund's sister, and she begs for mercy and implores the king to chain them up instead. He agrees. Not for mercy, though, but because he plans an even more cruel and lingering death. Chained to a tree in the forest that night, a she-wolf comes and devours one of Sigmund's brothers. She returns, ravenous, night after night, until only Sigmund is left. The next day, Sigmund's sister sends a servant with honey to smear on Sigmund's face. But to what end? Well, that night, when the she-wolf appears again, you'll never guess what happens. She-Wolf licks the sweet honey from Sigmund's face. He bites the wolf's tongue. The She-Wolf pulls away, but Sigmund holds on. The chains break, and he is free. After his escape, Sigmund lives like us, hidden in the forest. His enemy, King Sigir, believing him dead, as his sister plots revenge. And for vengeance to succeed, even the great Sigmund needs help. So she sends her sons to him, but their blood is weak and corrupted, and they're put to death by Sigmund. So his sister hatches a new plan, one that is cold of heart and pure of blood. Day after day, watching from afar, she mimicked him. Perfecting her own secret dance. Wishing those fleeting moments of light would stretch out to last. Sigmund's sister trades shapes with a sorceress, and in disguise, she lies with her own brother. She gives birth to a son named Sinfjotli. After a time, she sends him to the forest to Sigmund. He tests the boy, and finds him strong and fearless, and so they go to take their vengeance on King Sigir. Luck is not on their side. They're captured, and Sigir has them buried alive. for you by the tree. As Sigmund and Sinfjotli are being buried alive, Sigmund's sister throws an armful of straw into the grave mound. Hidden in the straw is Sigmund's sword, the gift of Odin. They cut their way out of the grave mound and set fire to Sigir's hall. The king burns to death. Sigmund calls to his sister to come out, so that she may live and be honored. She does come out, but only to tell him the truth. That she had slept with him, her brother, to beget a strong avenger. I am not fit to live, she says, and walks back into the fire. Strike vengeance from your heart, Senua, as there is always a heavy price to pay.
And here is the end of Sigmund's story. He was a fierce and great warrior who fought many battles. But one day, an old man came onto the battlefield. Although shadowed by a hood, Sigmund saw that he only had one eye. The man raised his spear, and Sigmund struck at it with his sword, but the sword shattered into pieces. Sigmund then knew that this was Odin, and thus that victory could not be his. He bowed his head and accepted his end. Dying, he tells his wife that she is with child, and that her son will one day make a great weapon out of the fragments of his sword. The sword named Gram. It's fixed. What happened? The bridge is fixed. Let's cross it. The Northmen tell this story about the death of Baldur. It begins with dark dreams. Night after night, Baldur dreams of his own death, and the gods fear for his life. So Baldur's mother makes everything in the world. Fire, water, iron, stone, earth, wood, beasts, birds, serpents, poison, sickness. Swear an oath not to harm her son. One by one, they each make their vow. Neither weapons nor wood will injure him, Baldur's mother boasts. Only Loki, father of Hela, the mistress of death, is not amused. He's gone. He's in the dark world. He's gone to the dark world. You're in the wrong world. He's in the other world. The dark world. Without you. The gods feast and rejoice and amuse themselves by throwing spears and stones at Baldur, striking at him with sword and axe. But he comes to no harm, whatever they do. The gods never cease to wonder at this great marvel. But Loki shapes himself into a woman and asks Baldur's mother, is it really true that all things promise to keep him safe? I did not ask the mistletoe, Baldur's mother confesses. I thought it was too young. Oh dear. There he is. Where are you taking He's up there. He's up there. How do you get up there? There's a way. Was it worth it? Yours. There is a way up there. Find the way. She can deserve to be dead. You're nearly there. She can find the way. Loki makes a dart out of mistletoe and goes to the gods as they throw things at Baldur. The blind god, Huth, was there. Loki asks him why he wasn't taking part. Huth says, I cannot see where Baldur stands, and even if I could see him, I have no weapon. Loki replies, Here is a wand. I will tell you where he stands. And Huth throws the mistletoe at Baldur. It pierces through him, and to everyone's horror, Baldur is killed. And for this, Hood is slain. The Northmen tell how the gods mourned Baldur. His body was to be burnt on his ship, but they could not manage to push it into the sea, and sent for a giantess to do it. She comes riding a wolf and has vipers for her reins. She pushes Baldur's ship into the sea with such force that the ground shakes and the rollers burst into flames. When Baldur's wife sees his body carried onto the ship, her heart bursts with grief and she dies. She's put next to her husband and the pyre is lit, sending the dead to hell. But even so, the gods cannot accept his death. Overcome with grief, the gods send Hermod to ride to Hell and ask Hela to let Baldur return home. All the gods are weeping, he says. Are they? asks Helen. 
we shall see what he's truly missed. If everything in the world will weep for him, he shall go back to the gods. But if even one thing refuses, Baldur stays with me. The gods send messengers everywhere. Weep for Baldur. Weep him out of hell. And everything wept. Men, beasts, earth, stone, trees, metal, everything. Except for a giantess they find in a cave. Baldur was never my friend, she says. Let hell keep what she has. The Northmen say that the giantess must have been Loki in disguise. You keep seeing runes. You see runes everywhere. Everywhere. But what if they're not real? What if they don't actually make sense? If there are true gods were lying. If you think the Northmen tell how the gods punished Loki for Baldur's death. They captured him and took him to a cave. They fetched his two sons and turned one into a wolf, and he ripped his brother apart. The gods used Loki's own son's entrails to tie him down, and turned these bonds to iron, and dangled a poisonous serpent over his face, so that its venom would drip onto him. Each time the venom drips onto Loki's face, he writhes in agony. The Northmen say that is the cause of earthquakes. A reminder, perhaps, that if even gods must accept death, then so must we. The Northmen speak of a death moon. A light shaped like a half moon that appears inside a house and goes around the walls. I once saw the death moon appear at a farm. And first the shepherd died, then a guest died, and then the farm hands, and then the farmer and six of his men drowned at sea. But that is not the end of it, because the dead return to haunt the living. If you see the death moon, Because there will be death in that house. It disappears, Senua. You have to get in. Senua! Come to me! Where are you? I'm here! I'm right here! Are you in there? Come out if you are. Find him. You have to find him. The rooms. Focus. The rooms. Focus the rooms. There was a Northman called Grettir, big, red-haired, immensely strong, but he was afraid of the dark. It happened one night that an undead creature came to his house to drag him outside into darkness and kill him. He resisted with every ounce of his strength. He clung to the doorframe, but it gave way, and they spilled out of the house, and the monster fell back, and the moon shone down on its ghastly face. Grettir, terrified, cuts off its head, but is cursed forever. From that moment on, wherever he was, he would see those hideous eyes staring back at him. Sometimes we allow our own fear to haunt us to our grave. But when it comes, and it forces itself onto our friends or loved ones, then comes the reckoning. Senua, you remind me of a story that the Northmen tell about a young woman warrior. Her name is Herver, the daughter of a berserker born after he was killed. She's a wild, willful child who teaches herself to fight with weapons. When she learns where her father is buried, her only desire is to reclaim the treasure buried with him, but above all, the sword, Tyrving. Dillian, I'm here. I'm here for the trials. Like I'll when we first him. met, remember? Herbert 
Hervor ignores her father's warnings. The grave mound opens, and it seems to be full of fire. Again, Hervor demands her inheritance, but her father warns her that the sword is cursed and would be the bane of her family. But he relents and brings her the sword. She leaves the island with it, but the curse holds true, and death would follow in the years to come. And so, Senua, the misdeeds of a father have cursed his daughter. No one can save you. It's too scary. I can hear him. Herva disguises herself as a man to join a band of warriors, and soon becomes their leader. When they come to the island where her father is buried, her men do not want to go ashore. They say that evil haunts the island, and that it is a worse place by day than other places are by night. Fearless, she lands alone. There are many grave mounds, and all of them have ghostly flames burning over them. She comes to the grave mound of her father after passing through these ghostly fires as though they were mist. The flames I passed through were real enough. Damn the Northmen to hell. It's not him. It's not him. We told you. We told you it was a trick. Within the burial mound, Hervor calls on her father to wake from death and bring her his sword. She says that it is not seemly for the dead in their grave mounds to bear valuable weapons. Her father answers with words of warning. You go to your doom. Baleful runes surround you. You have gone mad. You have lost your mind. Your thoughts are confused. It is dangerous to wake the dead. Like I said, she reminds me of you. <laughs> I will tell you of a great hero named Sigurd son of Sigmund, no less. Born after his father's death, Sigurd is cared for by the dwarf, Rain. But Rain does not love the boy. Instead, he plans to use him for his own ends. You see, Rain's father possessed a great treasure given to him by the gods. But Rain's brother, Fafnir, killed his father and took the gold all for himself. Fafnir hid the treasure out on a heath and could not leave it. And from the evil in his heart, he turned into a dark creature. A dragon. The light The light will guide you. Rain the dwarf's sole desire is to possess this dragon's accursed treasure. And he uses Sigurd to reclaim it. He tells Sigurd the story of Fafnir's gold, and the good-hearted hero promises to slay the dragon if Rhea would forge a strong sword for him. Sigurd remembers that his father once possessed a sword given to him by Odin. Odin broke the sword to bring about Sigmund's death, but Sigurd's mother still has the pieces, and so Rhea reforges the famous sword. Sigurd uses the sword first to avenge his father, and then he and Rayan go in search of Fafnir. By the time she realized that only she could see them, her father, Zinbel, could see the monster 
and her. The dragon Fafner is so large and deadly that it would be impossible to kill him face to face. But each day, Fafner crawls across the heath to find water. So Sigurd digs a pit in the dragon's path and lies in wait in it. When Fafner slithers overhead, Sigurd sinks his sword into the dragon up to the hilt. Sigurd leaps from the pit and Fafner sees his killer. He warns Sigurd that the treasure will lead to his death, as it led to the death of all who owned it. Sigurd replies that death comes to all men, and every man would want to be wealthy until that day. And he takes the treasure. And now everybody is dead because of her. It's all her fault. All her fault. <laughs> we she should have known. She should have. Why doesn't she learn? When will she learn? She deserves it. Although Sigurd kills the dragon, Rian wants to keep Fafner's gold all for himself. Rian also wants the strength and wisdom of the dragon, so he drinks its blood and asks Sigurd to roast Fafner's heart for him. Sigurd does so, but when he touches the roasted heart to see if it is done, he burns his finger. Without thinking, he licks his finger and tastes the dragon's blood. In that moment, he understands the language of birds and hears them talk nearby. The beast has the head. She will be trapped. The beast has the head and he's using it. Once she gets down there, she'll never come out. It's luring her down. The darkness will take her like it will come up. The beast. <laughs> the beast. Sigurd's newfound power lets him hear the birds speak. And they say, Sigurd should eat the heart himself. Rian wants Fafner's gold. Sigurd should kill Rian before Rian kills him. Sigurd should find Brynhild, the Valkyrie, who sleeps in a child. Sigurd heeds the bird's advice. He kills Rian, eats Fafner's roasted heart, and takes Fafner's treasure. And he embarks on a new quest. To ride to Hinderfell and find Brynhild, the Valkyrie. The longer it burned, the more she convinced herself that there was nothing beyond its reach. How little separates us. From what we fear. Keep the torch alight. Sigurd learns that Brynhild had once disobeyed Odin, and so he had her punished, stuck her with a sleep thorn, and put her body within a rampart of burning shields. Only a man who knew no fear would ever reach her. But like me, Sigurd is fearless and passes through the flames just as I did and wakes the sleeping warrior girl. She teaches him the secret wisdom of runes, namely victory runes, ship runes, runes for persuasion, runes for truth, runes for healing and help, runes for perception and power. Like Sigurd, the greatest young warrior of the north, you must learn the secrets of the runes to fight amongst the gods in hell. say the world will come to an end. They call this Ragnarok, the destiny of the gods. First, there will be a terrible winter, three years long. Then, mankind will turn on itself. Brothers will fight each other to the death, and people will forget what they owe their kindred. Times will be hard. Crimes will be great. It will be an age of axes and swords. The wind will blow through abandoned halls. 
Wolves will walk where children played. The world will fall into ruin. To lead so that others may follow, or to warn so that they may avoid. That is our gift and our duty. I'm not going to look away in fear anymore. The Northmen say the gods will fight their last battle at Ragnarok. Their watchmen will blow the horn that can be heard through the whole world. And Odin will speak with the severed head of Mimir, which gives him good counsel. The land of the giants will thunder with the sound of their army on the move. The gods will assemble. The dwarves will leave their stones. The frost giants will come from the east. The Midgard serpent will turn up the waves. Eagles will scream and tear at the corpses with their yellow beaks. The ship of the dead will set sail. The Northmen say that at Ragnarok, the gods will face a ship full of their foes, which Loki has steered to Asgard. It carries the fire giants, the wolf that will eat the sun, and all kinds of dark creatures. Surt will join them with his sword of fire. The cliffs will crash, trolls will walk the land, men will tread the road to hell, and the heavens will split open. Anyway, you have the sight, just like I do. Once you can see into the underworld, the underworld and all the souls within it will see you. Don't be afraid when they speak to you. I will always be here to guide you. Did you see her? That was her mother, Galina. Anywhere. We each walk these lands gazing towards different horizons, some of us further than others. Your father cannot see what you see, but there is nothing wrong with seeing the world the way you do.
Oh, Senua. Your father does not hate me. He just fears the souls in the underworld. He cannot see that they are already afraid. But I am their healer, and I must answer their cries for help, even if it displeases him. Senua, there will be times that you will feel alone and exhausted, like a strange little fish swimming against the tides of the big ocean. But have the faith to let go and let the tide carry you away. Because the whole ocean is your home, and it does not ask you to swim against it. We spend our lives searching for the meaning in life, and we ask the gods for guidance. But the truth to life is revealed when we can face death without fear. How can the gods understand us if they refuse to die themselves? piled up. No one was laughing. And they knew that she was not like that. Senua, don't cry. The world needs people like us, because we reveal the secrets that they are blind to. Sometimes when we dream of a coming storm, they may think we've brought the storm with us. What they say about me is not true. They are just scared. We must forgive them. We must forgive them. If only we could see life through each other's eyes, there would be no hatred. We only hate what we fear. We only fear what we cannot see. Your father. And I will keep on trying, but his gods will not let him avert his gaze. But if he could, he would know not to turn his anger on us. <laughs> <laughs> 